So highly defensible property. Um, we'll look at it in the context of North Carolina, Arizona, Colorado. Always includes your home, sometimes home and business, sometimes occupied vehicle, not unoccupied vehicle. And what the states that provide additional privilege for the use of deadly force in the context of highly defensible property do typically is create a legal presumption of a reasonable fear of an imminent threat of unlawful deadly force harm by the defender inside the highly defensible property against the person threatening in the context of that property. And that legal presumption essentially gives you everything you need, presumes to be present, all the elements required for the lawful use of deadly defensive force. So what are the things that are required? Well, there are the five elements of self-defense. Again, you can get this cheat sheet for free at lawofselfdefense.com slash elements. But the elements are innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Innocence, you're not the aggressor. Imminence, the threat's actually occurring or immediately about to occur. Proportionality, you're not using deadly force unless you're facing a deadly force threat. Avoidance has to do with whether or not there's a legal duty to retreat. And reasonableness, your perceptions, your decisions, your actions in self-defense are those of a reasonable person. You subjectively believe in the need to use force and a reasonable and prudent person in your circumstances would share that belief. You don't have an irrational fear of what's happening. In other words, you're not imagining a threat. So innocence, imminence, proportionality, avoidance, and reasonableness. Well, what these legal presumptions do for you in the context of highly defensible property is they presume that you had a reasonable fear of imminent, unlawful, deadly force harm at the hands of the, this intruder. Well, that's giving you four of the five elements of self-defense right there. That the threat was imminent, that your perception of the threat was reasonable, that it was a deadly force threat, and that you're the innocent actor. I mean, you're in your home and they're invading your home. And avoidance doesn't apply because if nothing else, even if you're not in a stand your ground state, if you're in your home, for example, the castle doctrine would apply. And if, it, if you're in something like an unoccupied vehicle, you're not escaping from within the vehicle. So if safe, if safe retreat's not practically possible, then even a legal duty to retreat would not normally apply. So the legal presumption of reasonableness basically gives you every element you need to justify you, your use of deadly defensive force in the context of highly defensible property if, if you meet the conditions of that privilege for use of force in defense of highly defensible property and you don't trigger any of the exclusions. So there's a list of conditions, qualifications, at least one of which has to be triggered, checked off, for you to get the benefit of this legal presumption. And there are a number of exclusions typically that you need not to trigger. So you don't lose the benefit of the legal presumption. Now I wanna make clear, the legal presumption does not replace your core privilege to use force in self-defense. You always have that. So if you lose, for whatever reason, the legal presumption, the benefit of this special provision, for use of force in defense of highly defensible property. You can lose that legal presumption. You still have your core privilege to claim self-defense, but you would be doing it without the benefit of the legal presumption, just to be clear. So the legal presumption should be thought of as a bonus you get on top of your normal claim of self-defense. So let's make that a little more concrete by taking a look at North Carolina law. Now, remember in the context of the facts of this case, uh, apparently the uh, the person shot, the gentleman shot in this case, was angry over some kind of road road rage incident. He followed this woman uh, woman's car into a parking lot, got out of his own vehicle, and attempted to uh, unlawfully and forcibly enter her vehicle, uh, at which point she shot him and killed him. So let's take a look. So here's an example of, uh, I mentioned we have state-specific law for each of the 50 states, a separate course for each state. This is pulled from uh, Section 9, Defensive Property, from the North Carolina-specific course. Again, we have this for each of the 50 states. So if you'd like it for your state, just look at the banner below, lawofselfdefense.com slash state. will take you where you can acquire that. Uh, now, this chapter, this section of the class covers both personal property and highly defensible property. I'm going to skip over the personal property stuff because just accept 
uh, up front that you can only use non-deadly force in defense of personal property. So we're going to focus here on highly defensible property. So how does North Carolina define highly defensible property? Well, here's the title of the relevant North Carolina statute, 14-51.2, Home, Workplace, and Motor Vehicle Protection. Well, that's telling you the context right now of what qualifies as highly defensible property under North Carolina law, your home, your workplace, and motor vehicle. Now, again, I caution this is an occupied motor vehicle. An unoccupied motor vehicle is merely personal property. No special provisions for the defense of an unoccupied personal vehicle. Uh, and the title continues, presumption of fear of death or serious bodily injury. So already the title is telling us this is a legal presumption statute in the context of highly defensible property, home, workplace, and motor vehicle. And the first sentence of the relevant paragraph, which happens to be paragraph B, the lawful occupant of a home, motor vehicle, or workplace. So you need to be an occupant, not owner, occupant. So these need to be occupied. And the person who has the benefit of the legal presumption is someone who's lawfully inside, who's the lawful occupant of a home, motor vehicle, or workplace. The statute continues, is presumed to have held a reasonable fear of imminent death or serious bodily harm. What's that giving you? Reasonableness, eminence, proportionality, that the degree of threat you're facing is a deadly force threat. To himself, when using defensive force that's intended or likely to cause death, so you're using deadly defensive force, if both of the following apply, so here are two conditions that have to be met under North Carolina law for this legal presumption to be triggered. One, the person against whom the defensive force was used was in the process of unlawfully and forcefully entering or had unlawfully and forcefully entered a home, motor vehicle, or workplace. And then it goes on to cover a kidnapping type scenario, which we'll skip here. So, the important word I want you to focus on here, the phrase is unlawfully and forcefully entering. It's not enough that they only unlawfully entered. They have to also have forcefully entered. Why both requirements? Why is unlawful not enough? Because the legislature is concerned about something we can call the innocent intruder. The innocent intruder is someone who may be in your home unlawfully. They don't have legal privilege to be there, but they're there without malice. They're not there with evil intent. And the legislature, the North Carolina legislature, does not want to give you the benefit of this legal presumption if you shoot dead the innocent intruder. Now, what might an innocent intruder look like? Um, it could look like a, a tradesman, uh, a, a dishwasher repairman who's sent to the wrong home. He's told by his bosses, hey, John Smith, at 3 Jones Street, needs their dishwasher fixed, but they can't be home. They have important appointments. So they're going to leave the back door unlocked for you so you can get in and, and fix the dishwasher while they're away. And unfortunately, the repairman is given an address that's incorrect. So he goes to the address he's given, but that's not the home of Jones. That's not a home where he's been given permission to enter. But he goes to the back door, believing he's at the right address. He, it's unlocked. He walks in. Guess what? He's there unlawfully. But he's not there with malice. He's not there to hurt anybody. It's an innocent mistake. However, there is no innocent explanation for why he would have broken something to get into the home. So when we add that condition of forcefully, we eliminate the prospect that the intruder was innocent, was lacking malice. If they broke something to get in, we can reasonably presume that they're acting with malice. So... Most legal presumptions of reasonableness mirror this North Carolina approach by requiring both unlawfully and forcefully, forcefully entered because it removes the ambiguity, ambiguity around a potential innocent intruder. The second condition is that the person who uses defensive force, the defender inside the home, business, vehicle, knew or had reason to believe that an unlawful and forcible entry or unlawful and forcible act was occurring. Why do they require this? Because they don't want to give you the benefit of this presumption 
if you yourself were surprised after the fact that a forcible and unlawful entry had occurred. So you can imagine a scenario in which you come across an intruder in your home, you draw your gun, you shoot him dead, and afterwards you learn that something was broken to get in. That's not what this is intended to apply to. This is intended to apply to a situation where you knew or had reason to believe. You heard glass break in the middle of the night. That would be sufficient to create a reason to believe that an unlawful and forcible entry had occurred. But you do need to be in possession of this belief at the time you use the force. You don't just learn of it afterwards. So under North Carolina's legal presumption, and this is pretty common across other states too that have this kind of statute, both unlawful and forcible entry are required to trigger this legal presumption, and you have to have known it at the time you used force. Then we have the exclusions, and most of these legal presumptions also include a list of exclusions. So even if you achieve, match, meet the conditions, you can still lose this legal presumption if one of these exclusions is also triggered. And this is a pretty common set of exclusions. Um, one of them is the person against whom the force is used has the right to be in or is a lawful resident of the home. So it's not a co-dweller. I mean, if it is a co-dweller, then they, don't, they wouldn't really be meeting the unlawful, unlawfully present condition anyway, right? Uh, they do have a special provision here for domestic violence protection orders. Uh, so if you're a spouse and you've been given a protection order that you're not allowed on the premises, well, then you're not a lawful resident of the home. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't, trigger this exclusion, but you also wouldn't uh, be unlawfully, I mean, you couldn't be lawfully present if there was a court order that you shouldn't be there. <clears throat> the second ex exclusion applies to the kidnapping scenario. It's not a kidnapping scenario where the person being removed from the home um, or, or motor vehicle or workplace is a child or grandchild or otherwise in the lawful custody or under the lawful guardianship of the person doing the removing against whom the force was used. It's not a kidnapping if the person taking the child has custody, and therefore you, it would exclude the legal presumption. Um, you also don't get the benefit of the legal presumption if you're using the home, motor vehicle, or workplace for criminal purposes. So if you're using your home as a meth lab, you don't get the benefit of the legal presumption. And the final exclusion, very common, the person against whom you, the defensive force was used was a law enforcement officer or a bail bondsman who entered the home motor vehicle or workplace as part of their official duties. So very common. Oh, there's a fifth one here. Uh, this is less common. This is used, has discontinued all efforts to unlawfully and forcibly entered and has exited the home motor vehicle or workplace. So if they've stopped trying to get in, or they've left, you no longer get the benefit of the legal presumption of reasonable fear of eminent deadly force harm. Uh, here's another presumption that's, that these statutes often build in as well. So what we just talked about was a legal presumption about the mental state of the defender, that the defender, it's legally presumed the defender had a reasonable fear of eminent deadly force harm. But many states also add a legal presumption about the mental state of the intruder, and here it is, a person who unlawfully and by force, both unlawful and forcible, enters or attempts to enter the home, motor vehicle, or workplace is presumed to be doing so with the intent to commit an unlawful act involving force or violence. And then they have some definitions here. Uh, here's home, a building or conveyance of any kind to include its curtilage. Curtilage is the area immediately around your home. That's part of the normal day-to-day -day use of your home. Um, whether the building or conveyance is temporary or permanent, what, what would a conveyance be, by the way, folks? That would be like a, a, an RV, right? Or a trailer that you may be vacationing in, uh, which has a roof over it, including a tent. So while you're using a tent to live in, while you're camping, the tent becomes your home for purposes of this legal presumption, uh, as long as it's in designed as temporary or permanent residence. So it's not just storage. It's a place where people would live. Uh, motor vehicle is defined elsewhere. Workplace, uh, a building or conveyance of any kind, whether temporary or permanent, so a food stamp would work. Mobile or immobile has a roof, including a tent, which is being used for commercial purposes. Uh, and then a definition of curtilage. I, I don't want to dive too deep into that. 
and then we get to jury instructions, but I'll skip that as well. So the important points for North Carolina is that I want to focus on in today's show is this requirement that the intrusion be unlawful and forceful and forceful. So both unlawful and forcible to remove the risk of the innocent intruder.